Panic, surprise, anger, lots of anger. The instant violence, the, the level of the kinetic attacks both coming at us, away. I thought I was prepared for it, but uh, I wasn't. I was in Operation Iraqi Freedom, the initial push, 03 to 04. My war was the Vietnam War. And the first thing I saw in combat was um, the immediate aftermath of B-52 strikes, uh, where there were just lots of bodies, lots of things that had been human uh, just minutes before. Well, when people experience emotional trauma, whether it's a fire or an accident or abuse uh, or being in a war and you see your buddy's head get blown off, uh, your brain reacts to it in its emotional centers. For some people, not everybody, but for some people, those emotional centers, when they get flamed, they stay in a heightened state. Everybody asks me, well, do you have flashbacks? And I'm not sure I have flashbacks, I have smellbacks. The first time I can remember uh, being around an automobile accident here in the United States years later and smelling blood, it was just like I was back there. Once I learned what it was, I realized I was having symptoms over there. I was having nightmares over there while I was there. I was uh, on edge a lot, but I guess that'd be just from the stress of the situation. Um, tempers would flare, oh, that was with uh, most of us. I mean, I saw a lieutenant and a first sergeant get into a fist fight over an Iraqi being in this context while he's fixing the air conditioner. It's, I don't know. I mean, some of the symptoms I've had then, I still have now, but they didn't develop till I was there, and they just never went away. They, they're living in the past because they have brought that past into the present, right? So even, but even when they're not actively thinking about that past moment, their body still lives there. I think when I first became aware that I was having trouble was when my wife and children said, will you just stop trying to control everything we do? I was trying to control what was kind of uncontrollable and that came back home with me. Uh, what might have been appropriate in combat was definitely not appropriate in social family situations. I didn't recognize it though until I mean, it was years later and my family broke up and it ended in divorce and, and it, was, uh, it was pretty emotional for me. The, the emotion we see, we actually call it a diamond pattern. And at the top of the diamond is an area called the anterior cingulate gyrus. It's the part of your brain that allows you to go from thought to thought, move from idea to idea to shift your attention. And when we see that works too hard, people tend to get stuck on negative thoughts or negative behaviors. And clearly PTSD is you get stuck on the trauma. Um, at the middle part of the diamond, the two side parts is the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia are experiences that it's heavily involved with anxiety. Um, and clearly you're tense and you can't let go. And the bottom of the diamond is called the thalamus, part of the limbic system. Um, and it tends to be correlated with depression. So you tend to be sad, anxious, and you can't let go. My wife Really, she had to deal with it the most. There were times she had to walk on eggshells. There was a while there, it was real bad. It was my reason for not being in the Army. They put me out on it. It, it, it affects everybody around you. So where does resolution lie for post-traumatic stress disorder? It means basically decoupling that body memory from the historical memory. And that is what we do with neurofeedback. I was a neurofeedback therapist before I did imaging. In fact, it's part of the road that got me to imaging. Doing neurofeedback taught me to look at the brain and to go about changing it. First part of neurofeedback for PTSD involves teaching the brain to be more calm and more stable. Particularly the right brain, which is hyper-aroused with PTSD. The right brain controls our awareness and response to the world around us, and that is inflamed, that is over-aroused in PTSD. And so we need to do a lot of calming so the person feels better, sleeps better, is less emotionally reactive, and so forth. At the beginnings, it was just, you know, relax, lay back, keep your eyes on it, and your brain will do most of the work. 
And then later he wanted me to think about certain things that upset me and bugged me and some things that didn't. I can remember just being in it normally and all of a sudden, first of all, I smell just this wonderful air, like I'm sailing and it, what a, a fresh breeze and, and all of it. And I felt uh, not lightheaded, but just clear as a bell and calm. And, and everything was just, I understand it's easier, but I, I didn't understand anything. I was, you know, it was just, wow, what has just happened to me? And, you know, when I realized that this was going, I, it didn't go away, it just stayed there. And then over the, the next few sessions, I wouldn't have to wait for 10 minutes into a 30 minute session or 40 minute session for it to start in 90 seconds. I would start feeling this thing and it would last the whole time. Uh, and this was good. The first part of neurofeedback for PTSD is to teach the brain to be calm and stable. The second part is to allow the brain to access and resolve the traumas. The power of Alpha Theta, or our deep state training, is that the neurofeedback takes the brain to this deep state between awake and asleep and holds it there. And in that deep state, we are out of our thinking, reactive mind. We're in a calm, safe place. And then the deeper fears, traumas, and so forth can surface internally, be seen and be processed, and be stripped of their emotional charge. I could actually feel myself being able to relax and kind of let go better and quicker. As I went through more sessions, I was able to get to that point faster. And when I left, it took longer for some of the small things that bug me through day-to-day -day life to come back. Like instead of it being 45 minutes after I left, it'd be three hours. And then eventually after about two weeks, I actually started sleeping better. Two, three weeks into it. About a week into the second sessions, we were doing 60 minutes, I actually started sleeping better. It's where even if I had a nightmare, I'd wake up, I'd get a drink of water, I'd go back to bed. Future's actually got some hope to it now, so I'm not worried taking everything day by day. I'm actually making goals and setting them out of distance and working my way into them, rather than just being like, okay, I'll just get through today. All right, I got through today. No, no jail time, no fights, no yelling, didn't lose my job, good day. <laughs> you know, n now it's setting things up further to the point of I have goals now set three, six, nine months down the road, even ten years down the road. I have a goal set for ten years down the road. We've now. been so excited about our work with the veterans uh, over the, the recent uh, months and years uh, that we've, we've realized it's really important to get the word out. The research on this technique goes back more than ten years. Eugene Penniston was in fact at the VA in uh, Colorado, Fort Lyons, Colorado, where the original, where he did the original research on this technique and had incredible results uh, with Vietnam veterans who were uh, alcoholics, but they were alcoholics because they were post-traumatic stress disorder. And so in that case, there was a joint remediation of the PTSD and of the alcoholism because they were so closely entwined. The resolution of the one meant the resolution of the other. And the fact is that every person in that research program succeeded, bar none, after many, many years of treatment failure. The results were staggering, and now we've had uh, further replications, and now we're just doing this work here on a daily basis, and the results are just continuing uh, to pour out of this. Uh, the treatment is quick, and it's effective and uh, it turns these people's lives around. I don't know how, I don't know why, it just works. <laughs>